Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome once again to Health Matters, a comprehensive chat by the Islamic Medical Association, Muslim health professionals trying to empower you and inform you. And uh, this is one of those forums at which we're trying to do this. We're having a continuous program on the ITV for some months now, and we hope that you are being well informed and enjoying this program. Tonight, uh, we got Dr. Yusuf Dasu again with us, a gynecologist and an infertility specialist at the BioArt Infertility Center in Parktown. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Yusuf Dasu. Wa alaikum salam, Yaqub, and assalamu alaikum to all the viewers. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa la aqibatu lil muttaqeen, wa salatu wa salam, wa la ashrafil mursaleen, Sayyidina Muhammadu wa alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. In Surah Shura, verses 49 to 50, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, To Allah belongs the dominions of the heavens and the earth. He createth what He wills. He gives to whom He wills female children, and He gives to whom He wills males or makes them both males and females, and he renders whom he wills barren. Indeed, he is knowing and competent. And of course, Allah is all-encompassing, and he distributes his mercy and blessings as he knows in his all eternal and infinite wisdom. And tonight's topic being infertility, we've come back with this topic because we did uh, a program a few months ago. We couldn't get to the treatment phase of this. But before we go on to that, uh, we'd like to just recap a few things. And I know some of you may have seen the previous program and view, uh, viewed it and may find this that a bit laborious that we're going back to one or two things. But uh, just to bear with us for those who haven't seen this uh, program before in terms of this particular topic. And so we'll quickly go through the definitions and some of the elements that we discussed before we go on to the treatment. So Yusuf, uh, we did infertility before, but just quickly, uh, what is infertility definition from a medical perspective? Yeah, from a medical uh, perspective, the broad definition is that it's an inability of a couple to be able to achieve a pregnancy within a period of time. And we normally say that that period of time is if it's in excess of 12 months. So if a couple are trying to have a baby together for a period of 12 months, having not fallen pregnant, having regular intercourse, unprotected, and haven't conceived, then by definition they fall into the category of infertility. There's, however, a few um, important exceptions things, to exceptions to the rule. Okay. And, and that is, if there's an obvious cause, if somebody knows there's a problem, if they're not seeing their menstrual cycles for uh, years to come, if one is not seeing the menstrual cycle, they're not ovulating, they need to come in a bit earlier. They shouldn't wait an entire year. But so th that's the one exception. And the other exception is that uh, women that have reached the age of 35 or beyond 35, the time clocks now starts click, uh, moving. moving a bit faster. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we need to perhaps be a bit more vigilant earlier. And right. maybe in that particular group, you start saying that if they haven't conceived within a six month period, maybe start seeking some assistance. And that's of course, besides the time clock, you have more complications if pregnancy does set in a bit later. So there are the secondary reasons also for that. Correct, correct. Okay. Uh, the miscarriage rates becomes a bit higher. Mm -hmm. The chromosome abnormality rate becomes higher. Mm -hmm. So certainly if one is trying to achieve a pregnancy, try and start earlier rather than later. Okay, so then we'll move on straight to, of course, the most important aspect of any condition is to, before you treat it, you've got to find the cause. So uh, perhaps you can just mention some causes and uh, I don't know whether slide four will come up on the screen and then uh, we can just look at a few causes. Yeah, so Jakob, we did mention it in our last program. So I think we will rather just summarize yeah. what we, 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 we want to talk about mm. in terms of different causes. Mm. Once again, very broadly, we can say causes can be divided into perhaps three different groups. Female causes as to uh, infertility, male causes, and many couples will have male and female causes uh, that are causing their infertility. And lastly, there's a group of uh, uh, patients that despite all our investigations, we come up with no particular cause and we call that unexplained infertility or idiopathic uh, infertility. So broadly, that's the group that we're talking about. When we're talking about uh, female causes, 
there's a few important causes. We're not going to run through all the different causes, but a few important causes of infertility. The, the one that's probably the most common in, un, uh, in developing countries uh, is a, a problem with the fallopian tubes. Either one has a damaged fallopian tube or, or a blocked fallopian tube, then that's a very important cause of infertility. Another important cause uh, is ovulatory problems. If they are not seeing their menstrual cycle regularly, or even if they are seeing their menstrual cycle, uh, but they may not be ovulating, then that's a very important cause of infertility in the female. That's an ovulatory problems, okay? The, the different causes for that would depend on what we find on our investigations, right? From the male side, it's, it's, it's more complex, but rather more simple in terms of investigation. Investigation is easy. You do a sperm test and it will tell you a lot. Mm -hmm. But from a male factor side, you'd like to know a few important things. Is the sperms of adequate quantity? Because you need a certain number of sperms to be able to traverse the female genital tract to be able to, uh, to reach the egg. The quality of the sperm. So we mentioned the quantity, the quality, and the motility. Mm. Is it mobile enough? Is it swimming in the right direction? Mm. So those are the important male causes and female causes in terms of infertility. Do you still find in this day and age that uh, before you even look at the physical male cause, there is the mental or psychological male cause where there's a barrier in terms of the way society has functioned over the years where the male somehow still believes that he's not the primary cause and he doesn't come in as a willing 50-50 partner in this particular thing for the, the in terms of management and trying to assist uh, you in, in getting to the root cause. So you've brought a very important point. I think things are changing a little bit. Right. We Inshallah. see that in the last uh, mm. few years that uh, mm. people now come as a couple to see you okay. instead of only the, the, the female portion of mm. the couple coming to see mm. you. So yes, mm. the, things are changing, but it's changing slowly. Mm -hmm. It should change a bit faster. Mm. Uh, you are totally correct that there's a reluctance from the male side. Mm. One is to admit that there is a problem mm. and two is to then seek help. So there's two problems. The one is the admission mm. and then seeking help. Mm. But as I mentioned, things are changing. Mm. And uh, inshallah, with time, we will realize that uh, uh, this condition is not only a female problem. It's a male and female problem. As you know that, mm. you know, if we're looking at statistics, 30% mm. uh, of the causes in a couple is actually related to male factors. So the primary male factor, 30%, which is very high. Which is very high, yeah. which is very high. Okay, so once you've established, uh, I mean, we know now there are causes, but we need to establish the diagnosis. So your approach when a couple comes to you, obviously, will be to investigate and finding the cause. So you're going to divide that into male and female investigations. And uh, perhaps we can target the, the, the female component first. Yeah. What investigations are done to reach a diagnosis to find the cause or causes? Okay, so, so we mentioned a few important causes, right? Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about, say, ovulatory problems. In the female, if we, we need to first find out, is she ovulating? So a simple blood test done in the mid, we call it the mid-luteal phase of a menstrual cycle. In other words, if you're having a regular menstrual cycle, if you count 21 days from the start of the menstrual period, if you do a progesterone test, that will predict if somebody has ovulated or not. So let us say that they have ovulated. Then we know, well, that's good. Their menstrual cycle is working. The hormones are, are reasonably okay. And that's the first step. But let's assume that they are not ovulating. The progesterone level is low or they have irregular menstrual cycles. Then we need to investigate that a little bit further. Why is it happening? So we, we know that the menstrual cycle starts from the brain, the hypothalamus, which then sends hormones to the pituitary gland, which then sends another message to the ovary to produce an egg. So we want to assess that entire um, cycle to see if it's running smoothly. If the person is not menstruating, you'd need to find out first, is the thyroid gland normal? Is the prolactin levels normal? We know that a thyroid dysfunction, either an over excessive uh, secretion of the thyroid, thyroid yeah. hormone or an underactive thyroid yes. can affect ovulation. Yeah. We also know that a high prolactin level, which normally manifests with 
leaking of the breast with some fluid mm. will also cause anovulation. So those would be the first step looking at the higher function. Mm -hmm. In terms of looking at the ovary, okay, the ovary, the most common cause of ovulatory dysfunction is a condition that's quite common called polycystic ovarian syndrome or loosely termed as PCOS. Before we get to PCOS, I just want to ask you, so when the patient comes to you mm. and you start obviously with the female component and, and you're discussing with the couple or individually, say, okay, we need to run these investigations. So how many of these investigations do you run at the first time? Do you have an approach where you do the blood test first and then you do what is called imaging things like the diagnostic, uh, trying to see where the tubes are patent? Or do you have an approach like that? Uh, is that the stepwise approach? Okay, so that's a very important question, I think, okay. uh, Jakub. The, when you see a couple, mm. obviously your, your most important thing that you see them is a good history and an examination, mm. all right? And often they will be, that will be followed by a pelvic ultrasound, which okay. routinely forms part of, a, of an investigation okay. process. Mm -hmm. That will alert you to a possible cause. The right? ultrasound. The ultrasound, mm. the history, and mm -hmm. the examination. Okay. Now, if you are suspecting that a patient has an ovulatory dysfunction, mm. yes, you would concentrate your investigations towards that, okay. but not solely. All right. Because sometimes the causes can be multifactorial. Okay. They may be having an ovulatory problem, yet the tubes may be damaged. Mm. So we can't only concentrate on the one. So we then see this as a holistic method of investigation. We shouldn't always just do it stepwise. Okay. We should do the basic important investigations and then do the more specific investigations later. later. Now your ovulatory test would be a, a basic investigation. Mm. Your, if you find something wrong, you then do the more specific ones. Like as I mentioned, thyroid, checking the uh, prolactin, mm. checking for polycystic ovarian mm. syndrome. Now, what is this condition called polycystic ovarian syndrome? Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, it's a common condition, and it tells us whether the, there's a metabolic disorder. Often these patients are slightly overweight. They may have acne, they may be hirsute, and they have an ovulatory dysfunction. There are certain tests that would alert us to that. If we then find that there is no PCOS, but she's still not ovulating, then another important cause is ovarian either dysgenesis or congenital absence of the ovary. And that also people will present with either primary or secondary amenorrhea. So that would be the one factor in terms of females to look how you're ovulating and if you're not ovulating, why you're not ovulating. So that would consider one port portion of the investigation. Okay, so we'll move on to that just now after the air break that we're going to take. But just quickly, mm -hmm. the reason I asked you for that stepwise thing, but sometimes there's anxiety associated because the patient has part of the investigation done, then has to come back and they're really in a hurry to find out what's going on. So obviously that was the, the, the rationale behind that. But we're going to take an air break now and then we'll be coming back when the lines will also be open and the number will appear in the bottom of your screen, but just to get that number ready for you, 11 or one or two or three. Assalamu alaikum. We'll see you shortly. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Health Matters, a comprehensive chat by the Islamic Medical Association. We're discussing infertility as part two of our discussion, continuation of a previous program on infertility. We have Dr. Yusuf Dasu here, infertility specialist, and uh, we were discussing uh, investigations. So we mentioned a few related to the ovaries and ovulation. Uh, what other female investigations should we be looking at? Uh, slide six comes up to show us the uh, tuboperitoneal compartment. So Jakub, yes, the, the next investigation is to see if the tuboperitoneal compartment is intact. In other words, if we start from the bottom, we want to know that the cervix is normal, that's where the sperm enters through. We want to know the uterine cavity is normal, that's where the babies or the embryos grow in. You want to know if the fallopian tube is intact and everything beyond that. So the, 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 the important thing to find out and what we want to know is, are the fallopian tubes intact or not? Is it damaged or is it blocked? There's two investigations that one would normally uh, do. The gold standard is something called a laparoscopy. That would be slide 10. 
Yeah, so a laparoscopy mm -hmm. is uh, a, a, a surgical procedure mm -hmm. that allows us to look into the abdominal cavity. If we look into the abdominal cavity, we have, we'll have a full view mm -hmm. of uh, actually what's happening in the, in, in the, in the, with the uterus, with the fallopian tubes, with the ovaries. It was, we'll be able to do something called a dye test and see if the fallopian tubes are patent. If they are not patent, it will also allow us to see why is it not uh, patent. Is it damaged because of an infection that has happened in the past and has caused some damage? Or is it damaged from conditions such as endometriosis? Uh, or do, does one have lots of fibroids that may have caused damage? Or are there lots of ovarian cysts or adhesions that may have caused this damage? So the advantage of uh, that procedure is you have a full view of it. But this. It's this quite a nice procedure. I mean, it's, it's giving you so many possibilities in terms of diagnosis and treatment. But of course, there are still a big sector of our population that cannot access what we still regard as, as, as fancy procedures. Uh, I mean, we get this in, in our primary practices where we get the lower income group coming through. And they certainly are not on medical aid and cannot access the laparoscopic procedure. And we still then have to resort to the old HSG. You want to explain the difference between the two and why would one be superior? I mean, the cost difference is huge. Yeah, the cost difference is huge. Uh, and HSG is uh, it's an x-ray that's uh, done usually in the radiology department. And it's an external view of what may be happening inside. So what happens is that uh, the fallopian tube is assessed with uh, a, a, a small little tube that's inserted into the cervix and then a dye is then inserted and uh, an x-ray is then performed and serial x-rays are performed and that will tell you one whether the endometrial cavity is intact or whether it's irregular and in addition it will tell you whether the fallopian tubes are intact so it's still a very good test uh, it's a reasonably uh, inexpensive test mm. and it will tell you quite a bit. It mm. will tell you whether at least the fallopian tubes are open or closed mm. and it will tell you if the cavity is normal. Mm. However, it won't tell you why it's uh, uh, is why it blocked it or why is it damaged or why is the cavity abnormal. Mm. Mm. So it's, if, the, if, the, if the finance is a factor, mm. then certainly that's an alternative test. And it may be a, a first line test in, 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 our, in our setting where we find that we have we deal with patients that uh, have financial problems. So it's, it's, it gives you good information, but it's fairly limited. Correct, because mm. it will tell you whether it's blocked, mm. but it won't tell you why, mm -hmm. and it will also not tell you whether it can be repaired or not. Yeah. Whereas a, a, a laparoscopy, mm. yes, it is a lot more expensive. It is also invasive because mm. it's done under an anesthetic, anesthetic. Mm. and there are risks involved with any procedure. Mm. Mm. And, but it's a very, very good test to assess the patency of the fallopian tubes, mm. to assess why is it blocked, to assess the entire pelvis, to also assess can it be repaired or not at the mm. same time. And, and not only is it uh, diagnostic, it can be therapeutic. If you have endometriosis or an endometrioma, it can be removed at the same time. So yeah, it, it would be a, a very good test. So laparoscopy, you can do quite a bit of intervention, which is beneficial. But of course, if you can afford that, then that would be very good but you still have an option with an HSG. And maybe slide 12 will just show us uh, a kind of a summary mm. of the investigative uh, element in, in, in your approach. Yeah, uh, I think that's a, a, a nice uh, slide that will tell us before instituting any treatment. Mm. I think the important thing that uh, patients have to know and mm. our medical profession has to know that mm. it's not good to just treat somebody haphazardly. Mm. First find out, is there a problem or is there no problem? There mm. may not be any problem and with time, inshallah, people will conceive. Mm. But if, they, if one wants to treat, first find out where the problem is lying. And I think that tells us the three basic tests that we have mm. to do. Mm. One is a tubal patency test, mm. either by a laparoscopy mm. or by an HSG. Mm. Secondly, a sperm test, very, very important. As we've mentioned before, 30% of the problems mm. lies mm. with the male. And lastly, is there an ovulation problem? Mm. And an easy test to do is a mid-luteal progesterone level. Okay, so that's an excellent summary, easy to remember, and also very systematically done. Uh, the lines are open, so please do call in on 011 or 2 or 3. 
Dr. Yusuf Dasu will attempt to answer your questions and queries on infertility, inshallah. So please do call in. So while we're waiting for our first caller, Yusuf, uh, we've done a fair amount on the female factor. We've mentioned the male factor, but what are the investigations uh, on, on the male factor side? I mean, yes. the semen, right? But yeah, and, and is it just one test? Yeah, it's a, you, you know, uh, Jacob, unfortunately, the females have to go through a lot more than but males. So, rewarding them so, a lot more. So, so they, 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 you know, for, <laughs> we, we're lucky from a male side. Yeah, sure. uh, it's really a, one simple test. Yeah. It's, a, it's called a semen analysis. Mm -hmm. It's analyzing the sperm and all its properties. Mm. So it tells us a lot. One simple sample can tell us the count. Is it adequate? Mm. Uh, there's a range of normality. Mm. Uh, it will tell us the, 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 the quality. And where we look at the quality is actually the morphology of the sperm. Are they all looking normal? Mm. You'll see that some sperms will have a big head, a small head, a double tail, a mid piece that's uh, missing. Those are all abnormal sperms that won't allow for fertilization to occur. But a normal form should at least be a minimum of 5% of the actual sperm sample. And then you're looking at the motility. We know that sperms swim in all different directions. They can be swimming around, they can swim, but you, they need to have a regular trajectory of uh, pattern of uh, no swimming sure. so that they can travel on their own all along from the cervix right into the uterine cavity, enter the fallopian tube and be able to fertilize the sperm. And that means that you need millions of sperm to be able to reach the fallopian tube to be able to achieve a conception. We'll discuss more of that just now. We have our first caller. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. It's Nasifa speaking here. Um, I would just like to ask a question. Sure. I am 20 years of age and I'm married and I've been trying to conceive. But the problem is I do get my regular period every month. Um, I'm not sure whether I should go to a fertility doctor or not. But I've been trying for a year and a half and nothing's happened. So I would like to know what the problem might be. Yeah, uh, sorry, your name is Nas Nasifa, is that correct? Yes, that, that's Nas correct. Nasifa, thank you for the call. Uh, Nasifa, yes, if you have been trying for over a year, then we say yes, I think it's, a, it's time that you can start your investigation or at least being uh, uh, examined and seen uh, by either your general practitioner or a gynecologist. You don't need to necessarily start at a fertility unit. You are young, mm -hmm. alhamdulillah, and you have a lot of time, and maybe there isn't anything major wrong. But it would be good to, because you are concerned, and I think yes, rightly so, that would be a starting point to investigate and see if there's a problem or not. Uh, if we look at couples trying to conceive, uh, we say that probably 60% of couples would be able to conceive within six months. And about 90% okay. of couples will normally achieve a pregnancy within a year. So you're falling into that 10% of couples that haven't achieved that pregnancy yet, but doesn't necessarily mean that there's a problem. Just remember that. That 10% would then be divided into certain maybe male factor problems, female factor problems, or sometimes no problems at all. But yes, I would suggest go and see your general practitioner he can start off with some basic investigations, the investigations I've mentioned, or you can see your gynecologist and let us, let us assess if there is any problems or not. So, yes, I think it would be a good idea. Shukran so much. It's a pleasure. Jazakallah for that call. Uh, good question. And uh, Yusuf, thanks for a very valuable answer because that I think is quite common that there are girls that are married at a young age and obviously the anxiety after a year because a lot of their fellow female friends have now fallen pregnant within that first year and they feel that there may be something wrong with them. But it's a very important point that, I mean, at that stage it's only 10% that fail to conceive and inshallah a large proportion of that 10% will eventually conceive without a lot to do. We're talking about the male factor and, and slide 17 perhaps will tell us uh, very important factors about the, the, the male element in terms of intervention. Yeah. So, yeah, if, we, if we're talking about uh, if there is a problem, yeah. in other words, assuming that it's a male factor problem, yeah. uh, we, 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 we know that uh, there are certain things that will improve the outcome. Mm. Okay. Mm. And simple things. And, 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 you know, when we look at a sperm test result, mm. 
Mm. We can see if there's a mild male factor problem. Mm. In other words, they are, there is a decrease in quantity, but not so bad. Mm. Or the quality is a bit poor, but not mm. so bad. Or mm. the motility is not so bad. Mm. In that particular group of individuals, they'll do very well with certain changes. And mm. one of the basic changes is a lifestyle change. Mm. You know, today, uh, our food we eat is full of uh, synthetics. Um, they're full of hormones. Mm. And changing our diet to a nice, healthy diet, uh, diet alone will, will change uh, the, sperm the, the sperm quality. Exercising, okay, eating a healthy diet, and, cer and, 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 and certain supplements, if they take, has been shown to improve the sperm parameters. They, they should basically include some type of an antioxidant. Vitamin C is an excellent <coughs> antioxidant. Uh, selenium and zinc has also been found to be a little bit low in patients that have uh, uh, low sperm parameters. So if they take a combination of, say, selenium, zinc, and a bit of vitamin C, that will also improve the outcome. And then our, if they have any factors that can be corrected, in other words, if they are smokers, we know there's a direct link be between male factor infertility and smoking, uh, alcohol use, drugs, uh, and certain uh, medications that will also, uh, so they try and avoid those medications, stop smoking, mm. if they are having any drugs, stop the drugs, and that will improve a lot of male factor problems. There's been some talk about the male factor in terms of certain types of exercises have uh, actually negatively impacted on the sperm parameters. Is it true? And What's your comment on that? Yeah, I, I, I think the I think the jury is still out on 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 that. Okay. We know that uh, uh, high high you know cyclists, for instance, mm. cyclists that mm. that uh, if you're going to cycle a five kilometer race and not mm. take part in competitions and things like that, mm. you you are, it's unlikely that you're going to be affected. Mm. But if you're taking part regularly in very strenuous uh, exercising such as cycling. There's no doubt that there'll be an increase in the um, external temperature in the scrotum. Okay. We know that the external temp that scrotum is an external organ. Mm. It's for external for a certain reason. It has to be below a certain temperature for mm. spermatogenesis to take okay. place. Yeah. So if it heats up recurrent mm. heating up of the sperm, will destroy the sperm and it will affect spermatogenesis. So okay. yes, I think excessive cycling and exercising will cause that. There's also some evidence that with constant rubbing and cycling that takes place in the, in the scrotal area with, with those type of exercises, it releases uh, tissue damage and that can form anti-sperm antibodies okay. and can destroy the sperm. That's but a I, I think inflammatory that's, process. That's an whole inflammatory process that okay. may eventually mm. cause an autoimmune response okay. that then starts damaging the sperm, sperm and, and, and certainly then the ability to conceive. And just for the viewers, the autoimmune is when the body starts to fight itself. So you kind of aggravate your own problems sometimes. But it's not proven, it's still, it's still a theory and, and, and there's more evidence still coming through. Correct. The lines are open, uh, waiting for your calls. Dr. Dasso discussing infertility, uh, 11 086 1700 or 2 or 3, the number is at the bottom of your screen. So Yusuf, after these various diagnostic procedures, We've attended a bit. Uh, we, we're going to then discuss the different uh, uh, treatment modalities that we're going to look at. But I think we'll just take another ad break and inshallah we'll come back. So please do call in and then we also want to discuss some treatments. If you've got questions on that, please do, do get your questions ready. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum, welcome back to Health Matters, a comprehensive chat, your Tuesday night medical slot tonight, infertility part two, where we're going to discuss the most important part of tonight's discussion, uh, something that we haven't touched on before is the various treatment modalities. Dr. Dasu is here in the studio, uh, waiting for your calls too, and the number appears at the bottom of your screen shortly. It's 11 or 1023 So please do call in. Uh, Yusuf, so treatment modalities, uh, I think this is what most people will be really wanting to see, their options, uh, because obviously there's certain things we can't even do as Muslims, right? Sure. 
So maybe you'll just go through it and uh, slide 13 will probably just set the scene for us. Yes. So, Jakub, the treatment ideally should obviously be directed at what the cause of the problem is. Yeah, obviously. Right? Yeah. And it's an obvious thing. And, yeah. and we, we know that uh, starting off, let's say, if the problem is a blocked or damaged fallopian tube. Mm -hmm. Now, having a blocked or damaged fallopian tube will not allow the sperm and the egg to fertilize because that's where it gets fertilized, mm -hmm. right? So if it's blocked or damaged, mm -hmm. it's not going to happen or one will have difficulty in falling, uh, falling pregnant that way. Mm -hmm. The first line is to find out are the tubes damaged to such an extent that they cannot be repaired. Okay. Because if the tubes are not badly damaged, mm. they can still be repaired. Mm -hmm. the, the medical term for that is called tuboplasty, mm -hmm. or, you know, the opening up of the fallopian tubes. And, and, and that's the first line. Let's assume that the fallopian tubes are beyond repair. So in other words, they cannot be repaired. You've had a look at it surgically, done a laparoscope, and they cannot be repaired. Then our only option, uh, option is in vitro fertilization, which we will discuss maybe mm -hmm. a little bit later. Mm -hmm. So yes, let's talk about block fallopian tubes, tuboplasty, or IVF. Let's say the problem is an ovulatory problem, right? Patient uh, fails to ovulate or having difficulty in ovulating. Slide 14. One of the most common causes for that is, as we've mentioned, a condition called PCOS, polycystic ovarian mm. syndrome. These patients have a metabolic problem. They have a high insulin level. They're often obese. We have found that patients in that particular group, if they lose weight, they exercise, 50% of these patients will spontaneously ovulate. So they won't even need medication. Okay. If they exercise, they lose 10% of their body mass mm. in the index, they will spontaneously ovulate. They also need to decrease the insulin levels in the body. Mm. And the one way of doing that is exercise and diet. Mm. And another way is to add metformin. medications such as metformin. You use mm. metformin. It's an insulin sensitizer, mm. and it will reduce the insulin level. And that alone also may help them to restore some balance in their hormonal disturbance. Assuming that they've done all that, and they still haven't been able to achieve a pregnancy, or rather even ab able to achieve ovulation, then there are many drugs on the market that can help with that. The one of the most common drugs is something called clomiphene citrate. And it, it can be given in a stepwise direction, starting at a low dose and increasing it gradually until one achieves ovulation. Okay. If uh, every time when one gives a drug like that, it's important that you check if ovulation is taking place. It's no sense giving a drug and saying, go take this drug and see if you fall pregnant. It's a futile exercise. It's good to take the drug and check if ovulation. If, it's not, if one is not ovulating, step up the dose. If despite that you're still not ovulating, there's another drug on the market and uh, uh, that's called letrozole. It seems to be working a little bit more better uh, in certain patients. And once again, you use a step up uh, formula or dosage until one achieves a pregnancy. Now you'll find that most of these patients that have this problem will eventually then achieve ovulation. And if they achieve ovulation, they should be able to conceive. Within a four to six month period, they should be able to achieve. If, however, despite these drugs, they still do not uh, achieve ovulation, then certainly they need to be referred out to one of the fertility clinics where either they would require in vitro fertilization mm -hmm. or they may require a procedure called laparoscopic ovarian drilling. So that is a procedure done through a laparoscope where small little holes are then made in the ovary mm -hmm. to be able to allow ovulation to take place a little bit better. What's the success rate of that particular procedure? In fact, the success rate is quite good. Is it? The, the problem with that procedure mm. is that it has complications associated with it. HR? One is it's, it's an invasive okay. procedure. So mm. if you can avoid it, and you can achieve ovulation with medication, of course, you, that's your first yeah, line. Yeah. But it's one, it's an invasive, you need an anesthetic. Mm. Two is that if you can imagine we are making small little holes in the ovary, mm. that re leaves 
a raw surface area. Mm. That raw surface area can cause adhesion formation. In other words, now you are achieving ovulation, mm. but you're now allowing this fallopian tube that mm. you need to have it mobile getting stuck to that ovary. Okay. So you, you, are, you are helping in the one way, but mm. causing more damage in another way. So it doesn't happen in all cases. Mm. The person that does it usually takes the necessary precautions mm. to try and limit adhesion mm. formation, but they are, that's one of the... So there's like a risk for future pregnancies that there's way. A, there's a risk for that present pregnancy and future pregnancies. Okay. All right, so, so it's quite a complicated thing in terms of uh, its, compli its, its, its consequences, yeah. but sometimes you have to do that because it's one of the modalities you have to try. Correct. If somebody is resistant, okay. then you have to try it, mm. and it's a, it's a reasonably successful modality. Mm. Mm. In recent times, we are doing one ovary at a time. Okay. So in other words, you do one ovary, you mm. leave the other ovary uh, uh, alone, yeah. so that if adhesion formation does occur, you'll have a chance on one side and one. you still got hope on the other side. So for that's from a female side, we, we, we need to find out. But um, you mentioned something else also there on your slide, uh, the GnRH stimulation. Yeah, so GnRH stimulation is, a, is, a, is an injection mm -hmm. that allows, if you have a very resistant ovary mm -hmm. that's not responding to simple drugs like your clomiphene citrate, mm -hmm. then you'd need to give this injection either on a daily basis or almost every second day to try and get ovulation. So patients that are resistant to the clomid will, may, may, may respond much better to that. So what do you, how do you choose between GNR simulation and ovarian drilling? Okay, so one would, uh, the, there's always a cost involved. Okay. And, and unfortunately, GNRH analogs uh, and are quite expensive. Very expensive. And the minute you're starting to utilize that to try and achieve pregnancy naturally, mm. you have to weigh the pros and cons of your success rate. Okay. You're spending so much of money with a 15% chance of achieving a natural pregnancy, mm. does it justify the cost? Mm. So then you've got to look at, say, okay, if you want to do a GNRH stimulation, maybe you should either add intrauterine insemination to that mm. or in vitro fertilization. So that's the one uh, way that we try and uh, establish when and how we want to use a certain drug. If despite GNRH, you're still not achieving ovulation, ovarian drilling would be okay. the, your best option. All right. We, we then uh, mentioned a little bit about in vitro fertilization. Let's say, for instance, let's talk about, maybe before we talk about in vitro fertilization, Jakub, let's talk about intrauterine insemination. Mm. Let's say we've had a, a couple, there's no problems from the fallopian tubes, uh, ovulation is not a problem, we've checked the sperms, mm. everything is all right. So in other words, they, they fall into the category of unexplained infertility. Mm. In that particular group of patients, you'd also pro probably try clomiphene citrate that, may that you'll always try as first you, line. You always try it because yeah. one is mm. you, 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 you are trying to achieve maybe a little bit more than one egg to ovulate yeah. and that may improve your chances. Mm. And two is that you can time mm. sexual intercourse a little bit better. Yes, so yeah. you can tell a patient, look here, have sexual intercourse on these particular days. Yeah. These are the days that you most likely are going to ovulate mm. and that alone may improve your chances of falling pregnant. Mm. And many patients just by utilizing that will fall pregnant on yeah. their own. And we normally say, try that for at least six months. Mm. Don't just try once or twice. Yeah. Try that for six months. Give yourself a fair amount of time okay. to see if you can achieve mm. natural pregnancy. If that doesn't work, mm. then one would consider, consider intrauterine insemination, or the colloquial term is artificial insemination. Yeah. In fact, there's very little artificial about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's totally <laughs> natural. That's right. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a very it's a misleading term. It's a misnomer yeah, type it's of a thing. Misnomer. Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's a misleading term. Yeah. yeah. So what would we would do in that particular case uh, is we would give a patient some stimulatory drug to try and get ovulation, either detecting ovulation by using uh, simple methods like the urinary LH strips, or what's more uh, accurate is possibly doing serial ultrasound measurements of the follicle. We measure the follicle, see when it's ready to come out, and when it's about to come out, and others when ovulation is about to take place, we take a sperm sample from the husband, we try and concentrate it to try and get the better quality of sperm, concentrate it in a small little uh, receptacle, and then insert the sperm through the cervix into the uterine cavity. And that would be the next form of treatment. If all else has failed in terms of simple 
types of treatment, mm -hmm. you then consider doing intrauterine insemination. There the timing is very important. And timing is important, mm -hmm. and one would generally have at least about a 20% chance of achieving a pregnancy per cycle, but th with a, cum a cumulative pregnancy rate of up to about 70 to 80%. So if there's no problem... Which is excellent, eh? It's, which is excellent. If you, within six, six months, 70 to 80% of patients would be able to achieve a pregnancy. We have a caller. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, doctor. I just want to say that I conceived through a three-aborted tube. Uh, I'm not just to give out to some ladies. That is still struggling. Can you repeat your question? It's not a question. It's a comment. I'm just saying that I conceive, I only had the three quarter tube. Yes. Okay, so what, what the uh, viewer is saying yeah. that she, she has only three quarters of a fallopian tube. Yes. And she's giving hope to people. Yes. And I think that's a very important point. Very that, you good. know, even yes. if you have uh, one fallopian tube and that's not working at, at an optimal level, yeah. doesn't mean that you'll never be able to achieve a pregnancy. Yeah. And we've seen this in our practice, mm. that Allah is great. Of course. You know, we, th we think that, uh, uh, you know, if, we, if I, I, I often... Uh, operate on a patient mm. and I say oh the fallopian tubes are, are damaged the endometriosis is so severe you try and do whatever you can to restore mm. some anatomy mm. but you know in your heart this patient will have a lot of difficulty but time and time again we've seen proven wrong patients come back and they've fallen pregnant all on their own so yes uh, you, you're totally correct that uh, we must never give up hope there's yeah. always hope and uh, ultimately Allah decides you know Jazakallah khair sister and that's uh, really raising the hope in keeping with our initial comment from the Quran where Allah will decide whom he gives to and whom he doesn't and we always have to keep that in mind and have the hope and pray to him all the time and that should be our primary uh, approach first and while we seek medical help uh, we don't have much time left so we just want to quickly get on to uh, IVF Yusuf okay so you know we always say that uh, you first try everything yeah. and uh, uh, if all else fails, intrauterine insemination fails, then one has to go for in vitro fertilization. Mm. Mm. Uh, if you've got blocked fallopian tubes mm. that are totally damaged, not repairable, one has to go for in vitro fertilization. Mm. Or if, say, the sperm parameters are so bad, mm. this, uh, it's extremely low or mm. extremely poor, mm. then one would consider going for uh, in vitro fertilization. Now, what is in vitro fertilization? It's just a method of trying to achieve a pregnancy when either it's not going to happen naturally mm -hmm. uh, or we're having difficulty in ha happening naturally mm -hmm. and it increases your chances also of conception. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. what is done is that the ovary is stimulated mm -hmm. with the drug that we mentioned, mm -hmm. GnRH okay. analogs mm -hmm. and it's, uh, FSH is the one that we normally use mm -hmm. to stimulate the ovary get it to grow as much, get, get to grow as many eggs as possible. Okay. So we don't want too many eggs also because there are complications with yeah. too many eggs, but you want a fair number of eggs. True. And what we normally aim for is around between six to 10 uh, egg eggs. production. These eggs are then removed from the body and it's done transvaginally. So they're removed from the body, they're then taken to a laboratory where they are then utilized, where they are then fused with the husband's sperm to allow for fertilization to take place. Yes. This is all done in a very sterile condition. Control a, environment. Control environment mm. in an incubator. And after a few days, mm. the combination of that egg with the sperm mm. will result in an embryo forming. Mm. Right, and yeah. between three and five days, those embryos will keep on growing and growing. Mm. Mm. And then one chooses two or three of the best embryos and oh. then transferred mm. back into the uterine cavity. And once they transferred back into the uterine cavity, our job is done, <laughs> the woman's job is done, she's done whatever she could or the couple has yeah, been done. Yeah. And as then we pray hard to Allah Pak to say, you know what, please let it stay in the uterus yes. and try and achieve a pregnancy. The general success rate of a procedure like in vitro fertilization is uh, around 40 to 45 percent per cycle. Jazakallah Yusuf, this is very comprehensive and I think we got through everything. And uh, may Allah grant children to those that are seeking children through the means that they choose uh, through dua and then seeking the help and the duas that I would like to read today is Rabbi la tadharni farda wa anta khairul warithin O my Lord, leave me not single childless though you are the best of the inheritors Rabbi habli min ladunka dhurriyatan tayyiba innaka samiyu dua O my Lord, grant from 
me, grant me from you a good offspring. You are indeed the all year of invocation. Of course, that is a very important thing as the prophets have also made du'as and there's examples of those in the Quran where they've asked for offspring and spouses where they can be the coolness of their eye. Of course, you want offspring that will worship Allah. And may Allah grant us all families and communities that grow out of this, that worship Him and serve Him as the purpose of our life. And Yusuf Jazakallah Khair for coming through to the program once again. And the viewers, thank you for your participation. And uh, may Allah guide you all in your attempts to get children. And those who do have children, let's thank Allah for what we have. As we say, Allahumma inna la dhikrika wa shukrika wa husna ibadatik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Health Matters will be back again next week, Tuesday, inshallah.